In terms of what I love to do, uh, I prefer to actually design and, and construct the buildings. So each one of those is in many ways like a book because it's all the people, the land, the, the energy of the process. It's, it's a full story, always. And that's, uh, that's how I feel about it. <laughs> well said. Well, all right. Well, welcome, everybody, to the Earth and Hand video podcast. Today, my guest is architect Michael Rice. Thanks for being here, Michael. Delighted to be so. I've just watched the most stunning sunset in the hills of, of central Portugal, so it's perfect timing. It's just set. All is good. I'm, I'm here Gorgeous. with you. How can Gorgeous. I help? Yeah, and you're there at your, uh, your new homestead, right? Yeah, yeah, this is our, our base in Portugal, and uh, it's wonderful. We're putting a lot of energy into it at the moment, and uh, it's very exciting. Very cool. Well, you know, it's really just a pleasure to have you here. Um, we've talked before, as you know, you're, you know, one of my heroes and somebody oh, wow. I really look up to, so it's, it's really an honor. And, um, you know, Michael Rice has been the co-author of... Uh, book I have here. It's called uh, Sacred Geometry and Architecture with uh, Dan Winter and Arturo Ponce Leon and Lydia. So I interviewed Arturo and Lydia a couple weeks ago. Nice. And, uh, and that was really fun as well. And, and I just want to give a big shout out to Dan Winter, of course, for, nice. you know, bringing me nice. into the fold and uh, introducing me to bioarchitecture, introducing me to, to you guys. And, um, I knew nothing about bioarchitecture a few years ago and um, had, you know, as you know, I've been doing natural building and designing and constructing uh, eco homes and eco buildings for about 20 years, uh, teaching a lot of workshops. I've taught a couple of workshops every year since like 2001, yes. something like that. Yes. Um, but um, I never realized that what I was doing on an intuitive level could even be explained, you know, more with the science and and getting into uh, measurement. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just really grateful to have found you guys, and uh, and you know, just feel like I'm part of the tribe now. So thank you. Absolutely, and, uh, yes, and you're very welcome. Whatever that tribe might be, but uh, you're very welcome because it's wonderful to get young people who are physically doing it because it's one thing to speak and expound upon it and imagine and, and seek to articulate the principles and, and practices and protocols that might constitute bioarchitecture, but it's another thing to actually physically do it. So, you know, imaginary hat off to you and all those others who are actually doing it. And then subsequently um, realizing that they were doing it. So it's amazing what you can do when you don't know what you can't do. If, you, if that makes sense. So because, sure. you, because you felt an impulse to do this out of sheer joy, passion, um, focus, you know, it became and it continues to be your deepest purpose. And, uh, and then to know that not only did you have fun doing it and you learned so much and you created wonderful uh, constructions of beauty and spaces of power, uh, on top of that, you realize that there is a fledgling science that seeks to describe it in a shareable way and uh, like Dan has his own very specific way of looking at this and he has not only been a dear friend for over 25 years but um, a mentor and a deep source of inspiration for me and uh, of course um, Arturo, Lydia and the others they continue to explore it like I do in our own ways and uh, also my, my partner Zana she's a holistic designer and uh, she, when she and I met, I have to say that, although you haven't asked this question, but I have to say that it fundamentally changed my understanding of what bioarchitecture is. And if I could share this, um, please, we were sitting down having a coffee and uh, she just said, so what is bioarchitecture? And uh, so I gave her pretty high quality blah, blah, um, or so I thought. And she said, sounds good, I get it, but uh, how do you know this is real? How do you know this is true? 
And uh, Zana really is, is uh, focused on, interested in, and very eager to understand something in its essence, in the essence of its truth. Because she believes that the pathway to beauty is through truth. And uh, so she asked me, and then I, was, I realized that I was relying on uh, learned opinions. I was relying on regurgitated um, structures of mind. I was basically saying, yes, well, you see, you've got capacitive charge density, and you've got fractal geometry, and you've got charge implosion, and you've got um, harmonic proportions. And she said, look, each one of those is a PhD, but how do you know it's true? So have you ever proven it? So then I began to say, listen, I've had four or 500 clients in the last 30 years. And, and she said, OK, and so what? These were not her exact <laughs> words, but she was gently inviting me to go deep. And I had to be honest that I didn't know it to be true. I believed it to be true. So after having practiced it, shared it, taught it, and continued to try and learn it, I realized I was back in kindergarten and it wouldn't really help if I were to go back and just start slowly grabbing again those concepts and those words. I had to have a clean slate, tabula rasa. So I said, okay, what does it mean? So we started looking into the concept or not so much, it's not a concept, but the science of neuroaesthetics. Does that ring a bell to you? Yes, I remember we talked about this, neuroaesthetics. Yeah, so it's a relatively young field of study, 15, 20 years old, but it's revealing that there are certain physiological and electrical responses within the nervous system, the brain, the optical uh, apparatus that result from the perception of or the sensation of beauty, harmony. Of course, the studies were, were based on many things, perceiving something beautiful, perceiving something ugly, measuring the difference. And in simple, simple, simple terms, when we see something, that visual bouncing of light gets received by our retina. It gets turned into a little mishmash of chemical and electrical impulses and signals. They get sent to the back of the brain, the occipital lobe. And then we go along and we create a hologram of what we think is outside of us. But if we, are, if we are perceiving beauty in terms of a natural environment or a consciously designed structure, the effect is that the electrical information that's running along the optical nerve is very coherent. And that would be a wonderful Dan Winter word. It's literally when waves are waving together. You could think of the metaphor of soldiers marching across a bridge that if they're all marching together, it, it's a resonant wave that could actually destroy the bridge. So they're walking in... Shunk, it's shunk, happened shunk. before, yeah. Yeah. And then they shuffle their steps as they cross the bridge, not to create coherent resonance in case it matches the structure of the, of the bridge. So in this case, if we have coherent electrical waves, that stimulates the, the production of brain hormones, of... of uh, neuropeptides and things that make you feel good, more relaxed, more connected, more grounded, etc. So in very simple terms, when we walk into a space, uh, before we have even a thought, ooh, this is a sacred temple, or ooh, this looks something, at a very fundamental, instinctive level, we take a few tenths of a seconds to uh, check for danger. That's, that's in us. So literally, you can think of it as you walk in the door and you're checking for um, a bear, you know, you're checking for a, a hole in the ground, you're checking for some danger, but you're not doing it consciously. It's like the first wave of survival thrival, and it, you don't even know you're doing it. Then as you step through again, there is the beginnings of also a mostly unconscious process of scanning the space. So we don't scan it like a computer, left to right, left to right. There is like a sonar of awareness just pinging into the space and becoming aware of the main attributes. There's a wall, there's a corner, there's a window, there's a person. And we're building up a map of the space, which is deeply instinctive within us. 
And again, this is happening in the in the flash of a an eye. You know, it's it's literally it's it's happening almost immediately. And then, once we have established safety and a general sense of the space, then we can relax a little bit, still unconsciously or or instinctively, and we start seeking for beauty. We start seeking for harmony. Now, most of the time, you would be disappointed because it's not there in our built environment. Or there is a presupposition of form, a boring box, for example. The result is that there is no major stimulation. We don't feel that connected to the space. But when we walk into what we would call a sacred space or an eco building or a bioorganically whatever, we step into the space. And if we have no perception of sacred geometry and no perception of bioarchitecture or parametrics or, or biophilic design, nothing, and we're just walking in like a baby, like with, with a baby's mind, and we walk into the space, there is an effect. If the space is designed using the proportions of nature, where the, um, the scaling, the relationship, the patterns, the movements, the light, the shape, the forms, etc. If they are dancing with the geometry of life, if they are cymatically singing a tune, a choir of, of harmony, then we look, we smile, we feel amazing, we feel ourselves expanding into that space. There's a production of these uh, serotonin and, and dopamine in a way as well, you know, and that floods our system in a very natural way. And we smile, our back straightens, we breathe, we step in, and we begin to not own the space in a terms of belonging or, or uh, ownership, but we own the space in terms of allowing our plasma field, our aura, our sense of self, our boundary, our membrane of individuality to expand, to almost instantly include the space. So interesting. And in that moment then, this all happens bang, 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 and we smile and say, listen, what a lovely place you have here, dot, dot, dot. But then you start to look and you realize that the window there, not only is it framing consciously a beautiful view of uh, some installation in the garden or a tree or a mountain, but the relationship of that opening, whatever shape it is, even rectangular square, relative to the wall mask left and right of it, to the height floor to ceiling, to the position of some components or interior elements, we start to realize, again, not consciously, but our brain is doing very complex mathematics. It's like drawing this out, modeling it, and recognizing harmonic proportionality. And in that moment, there is an increase in interest even again, and it becomes like a logarithmic expansion of appreciation, where the beauty starts feeding you, but not to the point of diminishment. It's feeding you because that's what it's there for. So think of what might happen at this point. You step into the space, you have this experience, and your first thought would be, there's something very special about this space. Okay, you get it. That's expected. Yeah. And, normal. and then the, the owner, the recipient, the, the person says, yes, it's designed according to sacred geometry, don't you know? And they think, oh, tell me more. Then says, oh, when you design this, it has a special energy. Stop right there. This is the point that I had this eureka uh, awakening um, shock moment when I spoke with Zana, because does it have a special energy? That's the big question mark. I couldn't prove it does. Now, for sure, you can go in there with some form of biofeedback technology, and you might even be able to measure that the capacitive charge density seems higher than another space, whatever. But what point does consciousness kick in here? So I think you and I spoke before about this beautiful concept of biocentrism. It was postulated and formulated by an American scientist, and uh, remarkably, it seems to answer pretty much everything. It answers the fundamental scratchy head aspects of quantum physics. It answers a, a huge amount of what's going on in terms of our perception, reality, simulation theory, what the hell's going on? So biocentrism in a, in a simple uh, single sentence description is that consciousness created biology or life 
because biology and life had the capacity to perceive. And through that act of perceiving, it collapsed the waves of probability and gave birth to reality, to, the, to, to materiality, to what we consider as the studded walls around us. So if you take these two things together, neuroaesthetics and biocentrism, and you kind of massage them a little bit and give them a hug and just think about it, what's happening is that consciousness is sovereign. So your consciousness in a sacred space that would be designed and exuding beauty as a fundamental uh, structural reality, that stimulates your consciousness, or rather it doesn't limit your consciousness. Your consciousness feels able to breathe, to open and to expand. And in that, you could get goosebumps. You could get this feeling of alignment. You could get this feeling of connection and interconnection into the interspaces between the physical realities and the elements of the space. So of course, we're going to say, this space feels very sacred. How, how did you do it? Now, if we try to measure it, who's measuring it? The consciousness of the people who appreciate it. So they have developed tools and, and techniques to basically give voice to what they already can perceive within them. And so in a way, there is no such thing as sacred space, in a way, because all there is is space. We make it sacred through our interaction with it. And if these aspects and elements and components of a structure are consciously designed and organized in such a way that these proportions are worked with and utilized and played with, then consciousness steps into the space and basically rubs its hands together and says, nice one, guys, I can breathe. <laughs> and, that, and that process is what we call that feeling, that tingle, that woohoo. So I remember when I was building a domed uh, space in my home in Ireland, actually in preparation for the birth of my fourth child at home, um, I remember some of the builders and the suppliers would come. I was building it myself, but of course I was getting supplies of materials delivered by the guys. And uh, down in the local builder supply yard, they knew me well as just being a crazy guy because they knew I was an architect and normally architects try to stand beyond, above and beyond most builders. But they could see that I wasn't scared of getting my hands dirty. I was explaining and chatting to them if they asked. And uh, whenever I'd come for new materials, they would fight with each other to get to serve me um, because I'd always chat or show them photographs or tell them how things are going up in the crazy house that looks like a UFO up the hills. So um, anyway, uh, they would come, whoever was giving a delivery, they would uh, you know, draw, draw the, the long straw to come and deliver the stuff because they'd love to come in. And I remember in the center of this dome, the geometry of the dome was such that when you spoke or sang or just even stood in the center, it, was a, it wasn't just a half a circle. It was based on the golden spiral, wrapping up and wrapping up. So there was a lot of complex, very, very, very simple, but nevertheless complex um, energetic or sonic effects going on in the space. The upshot was that when you stand in the middle and you just said anything, hello, there was a massive reverberation. So, of course, you'd expect that at a sonic level, because the sound waves are all coming back directly to your ears, of course. But if you said nothing and you stood there, you're still emanating some information. Your heartbeat, your electromagnetics, your um, bioelectrical, etheric, whatever. You're not just saying something and then you're silent. You're, we're, we're full of noise, just not always audible. So, right. Like the sound of a seashell. Exactly, yeah. So standing there, I would invite them. They say, what do you do? I said, come in, come in, come in, come in. Stand in the middle there and just relax, you know. Say something. What do you mean, say something? Well, not something specific. Just, you know, say anything. What do you mean? Uh-huh. And then they would say, like, what do, what do you want me to say? But even the saying of what do you want me to say, they go, oh, Jesus, what's that? You know? And I'd say, okay, that's, that's your voice coming back at you. That's crazy. I said, well, not really. It's just the shape of the space. So they would be interested. So... My point is that if, they, if I didn't invite them in and they were walking in, the first thing that would hit them is that this is not a rectangle. Therefore, it's interesting. So their attention is already up a notch and they're a little more quiet 
a little more humble. Uh, I don't mean humble in the absence of arrogance. I mean humble in the opposite of lack of awareness normally. So there's a quietness that comes in saying, well, what are you doing here? That's a bit mad. Okay, I see what you're doing. So there's a general openness. And in that openness, they can experience a bit more than you normally would. Yeah, curiosity. It's, exactly. It's a natural curiosity. And if you provide a very safe space for that curiosity, without testing them or making them feel uncomfortable, just say, no, come on in, come on in. Listen, stand there, it's pretty mad. And the, they stand there, they have an experience. And what? That opens them. And when it opens them, they listen, not just to me, but they listen to what's going on, including their own heartbeat. So there is a feedback loop. And then they leave there, they hop back, they go back into the builder's supply yard and they say, I had a mad experience up there in Michael's place. So the rhetoric or the mythology could say, Michael is some crazy magician doing mad things up the hill. But no, I'm just allowing for an experience that consciousness had mm. for the so-called everyday person. And they came and they were enlivened by that. Something touched them. So that was a sacred experience um, in, in contrast to the mundanity of our normal existence. So what, what actually worked there? Everything was from start to finish was about consciousness. The space was merely an invitation for consciousness. And I'll give another example. I know you haven't even asked one question yet, but I'll just keep rolling go on ahead, here. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was a structure I designed about 20 years ago for a, actually for families of people with cancer who were in treatment in a, a local hospital. But because the chemo and the radiotherapy may take many hours, the families would have to travel from some distance and literally were just sitting in the, the hallways or the reception area of the, of the hospital. Not wonderful. So a number of people put some money together and they wanted to build a center for the families of the cancer and also for the cancer uh, patients to recuperate and hang out. So it, it wasn't medical. It was for the families who were going through stress and feeling nervous and anxious. So the actual piece of land was quite small. It was a triangular piece of land that was defined by uh, a road and two high tension power cables, two lines of power cables, which would normally be three death lines for anyone, even for a healthy person, to be in a small plot of land with 10,000 kV or 10,000 volt wires here and something else here in a busy road. So you're thinking you want to build this sanctuary for people going through a heavy process. You're crazy. So the feng shui would laugh at you. The sacred geometry proponents would think this is crazy. And even at the time, I was fully in this. I was thinking, how can we build here? How can we design something? It's a disaster from the get-go. Yeah. So you know, I spoke with the oncologist, who was a, a good man. And I explained all this to him. I said, listen, there's evidence that electromagnetic smog can even cause cancer. It certainly doesn't make your... Um, you know, your rehabilitation or your, your, your sense of self much better. So he got it. He just said, listen, I can't do anything. That's the available land. That's it. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, so what do we do? What do we do? So I designed it based on the top-down view of DNA, which is basically a decagon. Right. I remember this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, however, the design was approved by the municipality. It started being built but I wasn't part of the specifications or the construction. So uh, it, it, there wasn't, I was only brought in because of design. The actual um, person who got the job was a local engineer and a friend of mine. He just realized he was out of his depth when it came to the complexities of the brief. So he pulled me in as a consultant. I did the design, he took it from there. But I was a little bit dismayed to realize that they were building this structure out of steel. Um, so it was an intense, excuse me, steel frame with concrete and plastic windows and no, uh, and lots of uh, concrete base with lots of metal um, in right. the car and high tension power cables. And my head was going, oh my God, this is a disaster. So just for and the sake of the audience, I mean, we got to explain why okay. the steel within the walls is uh, 
it really dampens the biofield. Yeah. It's been proven by measurement. So, so yes, the natural, the natural harmonics of the earth grid, which is uh, naturally feeding and supporting and enhancing our biorhythms, the Schumann resonance. It's a beautiful harmonic cascade of different natural frequencies that the earth emanates and our bodies respond to it in a very positive way. Also, you've got negative ions that are produced in nature by plants and running water and sunlight and so on and so forth. So exactly. when you create when you can create a structure that's made out of steel, it, it has an impact on these natural fields. And then you have high tension power cables only meters away or you know 20, 30 feet away, creating a very strong electromagnetic field that isn't part of that sequence. So if you can imagine Russian dolls, matryoshkas, one inside the next, inside the next, inside the next, this is a fractal array. So all of these lovely waves together create the complexity and the symphony of life. But if you take out one of them and you stick in, uh, uh, instead of these beautiful feminine uh, shaped dolls, and you take out one and you put in a, a tin of Coca-Cola, it breaks up that it breaks up that harmonic into two parts. It smashes it. You lose that sequence. Mm. So when you introduce a lot of steel and aluminium and aluminum to your guys, and uh, you basically get, and it, it can be measured as being a sick building. You know, it's yeah, no it's like a Faraday cage, right? You know, you're, yeah. you're isolating so your charge from the rest of the yeah. atmosphere. So that was my full belief. And in 99 times out of 100, this would be measurably true. But guys, listen up, because you'll hear everything from everyone else saying the same thing I'm saying, that it's bad news to build and design by this, you know? It's not a biological building. It's not a ar organic architecture. It's actually a nice shape, but the same old shit. So, um, but something happened that I wasn't aware of, and I only found out after the event. That once it was built, I sort of thought, oh, shit, this is not great. This is um, toxic, in effect. But I realized that once I went in a year later, and I spoke with the people that worked there, and I spoke with some of the people visiting it, it wasn't part of any study. I just called in because I tend to be friends with clients, you know, always afterwards. They were welcoming me. And they, I said, what's it like to live here and work here? And the response really surprised me. And they loved it there. They were coming in at the weekends, which wasn't part of their contract, because they preferred to hang out there than they did at home. And people were very happy there. Now, I did not do a scientific study to look at the, the national rates of remission or, or um, curing of cancer relative in this space, relative to something else. So there was not a scientific study. But basically, there was an overwhelming anecdotal sense from these people, both um, going through the space as patients and family and working there, that this place has something special. And I began to realize this is about the consciousness again. Because the space was a very unusual shape, everyone that worked there was on the receiving end of people's first reactions. So you've got a nervous family coming in. And they're meeting in a pentagonal reception area by a smiling face and lots of light and plants and lovely materials and colors. So they said, come on, you're very welcome. What's your name again? Yeah, come right this way. We'll get you settled in. And they open through and there's a 10-sided courtyard in the middle with a water feature and beautiful rocks. So all of these components and factors kick in. But the fact that it's an unusual shape all the while there's something going on neuroesthetically. The people without even knowing what neuroesthetics are, who does, um, are, are already thinking there's something special here. It's not that there's something special there, it's that the effect is something special right now. Special meaning unusual, special meaning untypical, special meaning this is not something I've had before. So when you experience that, you open. When you open, you feel. When you feel, you connect. When you connect, you heal. So is the, building, is the building healing you? Not directly. Your consciousness is healing you. And the building is supporting that process because it's not fighting you. It's supporting that process because it's reminding you and inviting you. So 
you know, I tell a lot of stories because it's in my nature, it's part of being Irish. So, but the stories illustrate the, 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 the what's really going on in my humble opinion, which is subject to evolution. Sure. It's not a definitive final understanding. I'm learning every day. So in a nutshell, what I'm suggesting is that consciousness is the key. And if you can smooth the pathway for consciousness to remember who it is, then you will have the effects that you call connection, healing, integration, uh, sacred response, um, tingles in the body. Because when you have a goosebumps, when you have that woo feeling, what is that? That's, an, uh, that's a bioelectrical event. In that moment, the hair stands up on the back of your forearm, you know, you get a tingle up the back of your neck, and what's going on? That's that's an indication that in that moment, your physiology has found its center again. Your consciousness and your physical nervous system have said, oh, nice to meet you again. I've kind of forgotten who we are. And it kind of coalesces. And in that moment, all of the particles of uh, light that are popping in and out of existence all around us all the time in the field, they pop in, they look around, and they see us as a centering force in that moment. And in that moment, we attract energy to us. We become a fractal attractor. We become um, bio cymatically alive. And that's the feeling we get. And then we become what might be viewed as more charismatic or more full of life force or more engaged with people in the space. And of course, that has a knock-on effect. Because if we feel more connected to the space, we're going to be connected to take care of it, to even enhance the beauty, to, you know, and then to take this beautiful sense of co-creative responsibility for it, stewardship, connection. Mm -hmm. And then when someone new arrives, you're inviting them to have the same experience. So with this repetition of feedback of life itself and consciousness dancing, you've got the birth of a story that says this building is sacred. Beautiful. Blah, blah, blah. So when you so, do something, when you do something um, relatively modest, like a small cob or, or straw bale structure, because you've done it by hand, because you have literally um, manipulated, manus is the Latin word for hand, you have manipulated the materials in response to a desire to create something beautiful. And that information and energy is still held in that touch of the materials and your field. So when we work with natural materials like wood and straw and earth and crystals and stone, and uh, we, we are, all of those materials were once part of the living system. And even though you cut a tree down, it's no longer directly source connected, its cellular structure can still remember what it's like to touch life. You know, so when we work with these materials and we smile and we step back and we tune it and we stand and say, that's it, that's, that's what I could do. And then when someone comes in, all of that intention is there. No tension, but attention. And it's, it, it's palpable because the space is basically saying, thank you for loving me into existence. And that's a powerful touch point for new people. So, of course, we're all saying the same thing. If you de design and build this way, you will create sacred space. I'm just um, saying absolutely, but guys, just pan back a little bit. And what's really going on here? It's the biocentric dance of life, perception, consciousness as one field of beauty. That's it. Well, I, I really appreciate the way you talk about this because it's, it's mixing uh, poetry and mystery with the <laughs> science and i think yes. that's where we need to be right now because it, i think um in my view like true science would be accepting how much we don't know yet absolutely. there's a lot of invisible yeah. stuff going on guys you know and uh yeah, you know and that's why i love um you know i'm reading a lot of like phil callahan and and uh itzhak bentov and uh Totally, yes. Bill Tiller, you know, conscious acts of creation. It, it resonates yes. with what you're saying is that, yes. you know, the consciousness, we are pure consciousness and our consciousness Absolutely. itself is actually altering, measurably altering the matter, 
you know, the stuff that we're made of. So I think it, it makes a lot of sense that um, it's kind of like this ultimate goal, this ultimate thing uh, when you're working with architecture, it's art, it's an instrument, um, mm -hmm. both musically and scientifically, it's a machine. The building yeah. is doing things. And, and first and foremost, it's like, we don't want it to harm us. Yeah. You know, we want it to uh, not block the healing vibrations that are yeah. surrounding us in the atmosphere. Mm. Um, and those are, you know, a myriad of different things. We got the electromagnetics, right? The electrostatics, um, the, you know, low frequencies, like you said, the Schumann resonance, the cascade of harmonies. Um, we're like, uh, like they say, the raisins in a bowl of jello, right? And the jello is, is, every, is the air, is the atmosphere. And, um, there's a lot of invisible aspects going on. The photons, the um, uh, infrared spectrum, you know, all these things are emanating through us and affecting us. So we want them to, we want to situate ourselves at the right place on the earth to get the positive effects and then not surround ourselves with a building that's blocking that. <laughs> yeah, very well said. And that's the essence of it. If we were to try and create a shopping list for sacred architecture, it's a very long list and it's getting longer every time. So you just mentioned about 10 different things. Each one of those is a full field of study. And if we were to try as, first of all, this isn't taught in architecture schools to any meaningful level. So it's not it's something we have to feel or open to, or at least hear of for the first point, and then uh, open to learn, integrate, apply, experience, tune it and so on and so forth. However, there's another possibility that could even be called like shamanic. Um, it's like remembering the future. Because our fields, you know, every one of our cells, we've got 60, 70, 80 trillion cells in the body, each one with approximately 100,000 receptors on the membrane. That's a hell of a lot of information processing power. And that's changing all the time. And the cymatic conscious uh, patterning that these fields working together that we call our existence that's continuously evolving the earth is continuously evolving consciousness of of the collective is evolving and some would say devolving but it's all moving in a good direction ultimately so all of these factors together it's quite impossible to imagine that you could hold all of those in a conscious array in such a way that you could apply it to the, the design of a space so it's overwhelming is what i'm suggesting so what do you do? So it was Zana who actually said, you know, there is a, it's like the unknown. How do we connect with the unknown? So you've got everything you can apply, you know, functionality, beauty, sustainability, um, synergy, environmental components, permaculture, bang, 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 bang. But the unknown is there because the unknown is the realm of all of this invisible information. It's the complexity of the field that is the field upon which you wish to build. That has a very, how would you say it? A hugely complex and context rich historic energy pattern. It's, it's the jello you spoke about that has been compressed with the footsteps of animals for thousands of years, with the, the hum of birds and bees and, and trees and winds and so on. It's formed as a historic energy, but the future is included. So. Tiller and the other boys you're reading about, they're quite clear to say that past, present and future is merely a social agreement. So everything, the, the final building already exists as a pattern of information as yet unformed. So how do we attach ourselves to that in such a way that we can call it into existence through our thoughts, words and actions? So that's by opening up to the unknown, we invite in that which we don't know. We invite in that which we, we can't know at this point, at least at the conscious level. And that does require a substantial amount of humility. And there was a, a few moments whereby there was a client, um, a couple, an American couple actually, who bought some land in Portugal. And uh, it was several acres or one or two hectares, depending on your where, who's listening. But uh, it was an old farmhouse and some undulating land. And water was a key factor here because there were sources of water on the land, but they wanted to distribute them. So we felt that the, when we saw the shape of the land from above, 
we opened up to the unknown and it became immediately, both of us independently recognized that it looked like a human heart, but not like the, the childish sort of ding, ding. It looked like the actual shape of a heart with the two chambers and the asymmetry. Mm. And uh, so we thought, okay, so we found an image of the heart and we imposed it on the map and it was virtually identical. So that was, it's playful and it could be considered contrived or pushed or forced. But we both felt independently, wow, it looks like a heart, like, like a child. So when we did it, we realized that when you look at the structure of the heart, the arterial pathways, the muscle layers, the, the distribution of the movements through it, it starts to make sense. That the energy and blood coming into the heart was where the water was based. The distribution was where the buildings were going to be. Da, 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 da. Everything made sense. So we found the center chamber. And on the plan, then, we created a geometry that was based on the geometry of the heart. And, uh, and in the center was an open field. And we, we constructed with the client a wooden chestahedron. Look that up. It's an amazing shape by Frank Chester. Chestahedron. Hedron means sides. Poly, polyhedron means many sides. But a chestahedron is a remarkable seven-sided shape mm. that holds many of the properties of the platonic solids. So we made one of these structures there. And in our sketches, our freehand sketches, we felt water around it. And we drew these patterns of spiral pathways of water. Cut a long story short, the client rang us soup some months later and said, you won't believe what happened. He was going down to just check on the structure, the, the chestahedron that we made out of old bits of wood. And it was still standing, woohoo. But he realized that as he walked it, his feet were getting wet. There was no water there before, but a spring came. Right. So the what's a great sign. The, yeah, the locals never saw water there before. He checked. So something happened. Now, you know, if we were of a different mindset, we'd say, oh, yes, we're magical architects. We made the water come. No, we didn't. We, we, we opened up to the unknown. The land wants to generate and co-create life. It wants to maintain the synthesis of what's there and open up to what could be there. We invited that pattern as a series of drawings, hand drawings. You know, we didn't imprint it on the land. We held it in our awareness. He and she held it in their awareness. They opened up to it and they said, pretty much, yes, we'll get to it eventually. But non-linear time, the land was basically saying, okay, you work on eventually, I'll do it now. And the land was responding. So literally, magic was happening under the ground. The geomagnetics were beginning to respond to the intention and the patterns created by that intention. And the water followed. Where energy, you know, where attention goes, energy flows. And water is the carrier of life. And so in this case, we got a spring turning up. So that's like a, now, of course, nothing's provable. It could just be an accident. So we're not claiming, aha, that proves that this works. Well, Give until me you build like 500 of them and then it keeps doing <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. And if this is useful, there was another amazing one, which is um, many, many years ago, over 20 years ago, I was friends with a good family in Ireland. And uh, she was a retired nurse. She retired young. So she was involved in, in um, the art world and the, the theater shows and so on. And they had two children. And uh, then they got pregnant with a third. And in that time, they were engaging me, me to design a building for them. So I did. But in their bedroom area, I felt very strongly that there should be an alcove. And that alcove stuck out into the outside of the building. So as you know, whenever you're building something else, it's more money. If you're building something out, you've got side, 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 as opposed to just one flat side. Every junction is another, is more energy and more effort. All more materials. corners, yeah. Exactly. So I was aware of that. I made it look nice on the outside, but the husband was thinking, do we really need an alcove? Like, what are we going to put in it? And it had a window, and a nice shaped window and so on. But And I said, look, I don't know. It's just very strong. 
And uh, she trusted me and she said, okay. He said, look, I don't have a strong enough opinion. Why not? I just think you're both crazy, but we'll do it. But the pregnancy continued. The child was born, a beautiful little girl, but uh, she had a con congenital uh, heart defect. So she didn't live past six weeks. Oh. Yeah. So she came home from hospital because the mother was a nurse. The hospital released her. And, but they realized that they were bringing this beautiful little baby home for, for dying. So you can imagine the energy behind that, the feeling, the intention. Wow. wow. And in their bedroom was basically their base of operations as people would come and say hello and help out and bring food and so on. So the mother and the child were there. And in the alcove was a beautiful crib. Now, the baby was with the mom 99% of the time. But sometimes the mother didn't want to stay in the bed. So she would go into this alcove, alcove with a comfortable couch and a little crib and stay with the baby while friends would come in and family to see, you know, blah, 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 what the hell. And um, so it was a safe environment that wasn't in the bed, in the space. So she and the baby had a, an alcove within which they could feel safe and everyone passed by. And the night that the baby passed, um, and this touches me even now, 20 years later, when I tell you, the mother and the child were in bed and the mother woke up and the child's breathing was getting difficult and they stayed with her and the father. And, uh, but the mother looked over and in the alcove, she saw her father, her brother and her uncle all had who, who had passed away many years earlier. And she saw these three beloved men in her timeline, in her genetics, in her family, in her memory, standing there as clear as day in this alcove. I wasn't there, but she tells me this afterwards. And she said she knew everything was going to be okay. And that night, the beautiful little girl passed and moved on. And her capacity to heal was, she said, was in no small way supported by this vision. And she says that alcove made all the difference. So I can claim no credit for that. This is about feeling and trusting. So this is an example of uh, connecting in with the unknown because we don't know what's going to happen. But if we trust it, don't overthink it. But if you're going to do something unusual that doesn't make so much sense, of course, do it beautifully. Because the least you're going to do is create something of beauty. But we don't know the effect of the future, both positive and so-called negative. So that entire process, she believes it was, a, it was the most sacred experience of her life. Unforgettable. Wow. And the, the beauty and the, and, and the grief were an equal measure there. But can you imagine if the kid was just in a hospital with machines beeping at her, you know? It's a very different energy. So this is where the architecture can create and support life in this case. And um, you're way too young to remember this, but maybe some of your listener viewers might remember that movie, Feel the Dreams with Kevin Costner. I remember that. Ah, How old do you man. think I am? Yeah, I'd say maximum early 30s, but probably late 20s. Almost 44. No way. Uh, there's there's another hat off good man <laughs> okay amazing well done yeah you're looking very uh, very enlivened it's fantastic well done um for almost 44 yeah i'm 55 so no fibonacci number so um so again the story and the point here is that sacred architecture is so much more than we think it is the the blueprint of creation and if we relax the mind, there's nothing wrong with trying to understand it. But ultimately, guys, we never will. Yeah. Not, with the, not with the mind that's still fumbling with tools. Right. All we can do is tip the head again in respect and playfulness and open up, allow, you know, invent, invite. And if we're lucky in the meaning of the full meaning of that word, something beautiful will arise. It's right. amazing that when you have the receptivity, it's like our, not just our bodies, but our beings are these antenna, right? We can pick up Absolutely. on so many frequencies and um, the higher self 
is what I feel you're talking about. You know, the God mind, it's not something you can touch with language or uh, analysis or you can't prove it necessarily, you know, but it's definitely there. And that's why you get this information and you decided to build an alcove at this person's house. And they may have said, Hey, you know, we can't even afford this. And you're like, no, you have to build this here. <laughs> so you have to convince them. And yeah. it's just interesting that 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 was my modus operandi for, for so long. I mean, I just decided, okay, I want to, I, I would build a sculptural building and in the process of, I would design it. And then while building it, you would say, oh, it needs this and it needs yeah, that. So more kind of like an absolutely. artwork of uh, expression, creation as empowerment and so on. But it's very hard to find the right clients for such work because you need somebody who has the funds and who just trusts the artist fully and say, yeah, yeah. go for it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's sometimes few and far between for that type of project, which is the kind of project I live for. Yes, um, but I think I see my role now, especially with this podcast, is kind of I'm trying to connect like the two ends of the spectrum, you know, where it's like, okay. I'm right there with you, Michael, you know, like the shamanism, you know, like I, I get it. I, I do ceremonies. I, I, I can uh, travel in different realms and, and understand a lot of different um, things that I can't define necessarily in language, but I want to connect it for people that, that don't get that or that, you know, they're skeptical or they, they're like, yeah, great. That's, that's a little too woo woo for me, you know? And so that's why, especially meeting Dan, that's when, for me, I was like, it just opened my eyes. And I said, okay, well, finally, now, there's not just one or two, there's dozens of scientists and papers and studies that are now connecting, like, you know, psi phenomena and like real magic and longitudinal yeah. waves and these things that produce yeah. these effects that we would normally think of as being uh, fantastic, you know. And then if you just get into the nitty gritty and you study nature itself, it's like, everything's fantastic i mean it's beyond our imagination what is happening in nature every second yeah. it's incredibly fantastic um yeah. so i think you know I, I see us as kind of we're kind of like ushering in like you said like there's the evolution of our consciousness as a as a group as humans and we're sort of uh facilitating a little bit like the movement toward acceptance of yeah. these ideas that are kind of new maybe for some people and then showing look you know here's how you can prove that this exists you know mm -hmm. you can show repeatedly with these measurements it's here yeah. even though yeah. like my personal take is like yeah i'm already there like i don't i don't need more proof but i want to prove it so that i can show it to other people and then i can also justify like i need this million dollars to build this building <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but look, all the scientific testing is again the product of the tester. You know, um, it's impossible. Right. It's impossible to create an unaffected test. Of course. So even the concept of single, double, triple blind experimentation is ultimately a joke, because the yeah, the placebo is effect is always more powerful than the absolutely, medicine. Absolutely, you know. Yeah. yeah. So what to do with this? I think enthusiasm. The literal meaning of the word enthusiasm is in theos, in God. So if you have a natural enthusiasm, which you quite obviously do, as do I, that becomes an infectious um, agent and, and invites the client to trust. As long as it's not too ungrounded and frenetic. You know, if it's grounded with real experience, enough language, shareable language, say, listen, there's a whole bunch of science about this. Um, I can link you if you wish, but basically, you know, the, so what really helps me is that um, if someone is not so sure, they don't want to hear about <clears throat> feng shui or qi or energy, you can talk about neuroaesthetics. That's a, that's a reasonable leap. You can say, listen, we do respond very positively to beauty, and beauty in this case would be organic forms and natural patterns and shapes, proportions. And they can be described mathematically and geometrically, and we can design them and build them. It's no big deal. Less materials, greater structural integrity, more interesting, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, what about the furniture? Irrelevant. You can fit a lot of things in the leftover spaces between two curved walls. You can build things in. You can build a, a couch and just buy foam 
just dip on it, you know, in, or, or upholstered foam. And they start thinking, wow, this could be really organic, like the building's growing. Then you could invite them to say, well, listen, it may be in the future that we spit on some mushrooms and a house is grown from your own DNA. So, you know, maybe in the not too distant future, we will form partnership with the mycelial networks that are connecting and growing below our feet. And I know many of the materials labs in the States and other countries, they are making structures out of myce mycelial compounds and networks. Yeah. So you can imagine if we introduce DNA to that, if we introduce... Innovative. Yeah. And uh, it could, you could grow your own house. And uh, bacterial cement as well. Oh, yeah, this is so amazing. So I really appreciate the people that are pushing the boundaries on this and um, playing with it, understanding it, developing it, and so on. So it may well be, can you imagine you could, the the, um, the gift you could give a newborn child to start growing their house now, you know? So by the time they're an adult, their house is grown. And it's based on the blueprint of their own genetic um, coding. So this is very interesting. So, you know, future is very exciting in this regard. In the meanwhile, we have available materials. We have um, a selection and a, an availability of, of workmanship and interest and traditional material, traditional techniques in the locality that you're living in. So how to turn these available resources into a beautiful structure that's functional, affordable, maintainable, and that does all of these things. And that's the beauty of what would be called bioarchitecture. Its primary setting and intent is to generate a beautiful environment where your consciousness can unfold naturally and invite you to be your best self, past, present, and future. And that's, 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 a, that's a beautiful offering. It's a beautiful service to be able to give. And it's a beautiful uh, activity to call your 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 life's purpose, yeah. so we feel very, we feel very gentle, very um, blessed with this. So we don't have our website, you know, is a, we have a couple of interfaces, but we don't do the Instagram, Facebook, Facebook, huh, Facebook, any of that stuff. So it, we're we're the opposite of what should be considered good marketing for people that are operating internationally. But it's all word of mouth. And, well, you're staying busy, right? Pretty busy. But, you know, clients at the moment in Texas, uh, in Bosnia, um, uh, some friends were helping here locally in Portugal, two or three projects still happening in Ireland. Even though Ireland was my main base 15, 20 years ago, uh, if you're off, out of the picture, people tend to forget. But what's interesting now is there's a new generation. The children of the clients from 20 years ago are now thinking of doing something. And they grew up in these buildings. And now they're coming back to me and saying, listen, you won't remember me. I was only three when we met, but uh, my, we're getting married next year. We want to build something. Oh, great. How can I help? So it's word of mouth, memory, and the matrix of service. And we, we, we always like to service one client friend at a time. Of course, it doesn't always work out that way. So we're, sometimes there's a bit of juggling, but we like to put that time and energy into people one at a time. Lovely project happening in the Netherlands at the moment. Um, two brothers that have bought some land and they want to do something amazing. So we never know what's next. We never know who's going to call next. And it's very yeah. exciting, but we're very, very open. And uh, actually, do you know what's interesting? We're consulting from a, for a Arizona-based virtual reality company. Really? And they're creating learning environments uh, based on sacred geometry. And a beautiful project. Then VR. VR, yeah. And... Wow. Uh, so it's great because you don't have any structural issues. You don't have any municipal permissions required. Budget is not an issue. So we come up with crazy um, structures, entire universes and buildings and structures, and then they do it up. One of their magicians based in New York just turns it into a 3D structure, sends a few screenshots. We tune it to perfection, and then it gets rendered into a wonderful reality. So it's a, that's an interesting sideline. Um, yeah, and a good way to test your neuroaesthetics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because then yeah. you've got all these people coming in for the first time going, whoa. And it's nice to have an interface that's not about killing someone. No. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm so, I'm I'm of the age that I never I thankfully missed out on the whole gaming 
end of things, you know, but I do understand that the next generation are quite comfortable in that world, you know? So um, oh, how yeah. can we- We're in trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another discussion. Yes, right, yes. Well, the ability to, you know, visualize is impaired when you have other things, external things, visualizing everything for you. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah but, absolutely. You know, back to your works. I mean, I know you've, you've worked with hundreds and hundreds of buildings. And one of the things that really stands out for me looking at your work and I get really inspired by it, is just the curves. You know, you have a lot of gouty esque shapes and curves. And um, in our last conversation, you've mentioned something about, well, everyone thinks it's going to be way more expensive to do all these curving buildings, especially they're made of wood. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I, I think that too, you know, because that's kind of what I've learned in, in the environment I'm here in Oregon. You know, I've learned that from other contractors and projects I've done. And and you said, no, that's not the case. We just have very skilled uh, timber framers, very skilled carpenters, and then we work with but, them. Okay, so, so talk a little bit about that because I think yeah, people yeah, need to hear that. For sure, for your listeners and viewers, there's something there. So of course, if you see the buildings, especially as they were being constructed in some still shots and maybe some video footage, it looks like everything there was hand cut with laser cut with precision which of course instigates the understandable belief that this took time, money, waste material, effort, expertise, which all had dollar signs at the end of them. So it's a reasonable presumption that such a building would cost one and a half to two and a half times the price of a normal building. That just isn't our experience for a simple reason. So 22 years ago or so, I was building an extension to my family home to, to create a space for seminars and so on. I designed it, but couldn't find a builder. Now, even then, it was quite rectilinear. It was based on the golden rectangle. There was a square, 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 square. The glass was a bit curvy. So it was just a little bit um, confusing for the average builder. So I, I wasn't in any particular rush. I said, okay, something will happen. And a few days later, as it turns out, I very synchronously met a man from London, Ontario in Canada. His name was Mel. And Mel was coming to Ireland on a retirement holiday with his wife. So literally he had been a standard stick framer for 50 years plus. And he had only been straight lines only stick build with a hammer, no nail guns, hammer, nails, and the normal six by two, four, four by two vertical stick frame. So he came and we got chatting and uh, he said, what do you do? I said, architect. He says, oh, really? I work with some architects, blah, 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 blah. And I showed him the sketches and he said, I'd love to build that. And I said, could you build it? He said, yeah. And I said, well, do, you know, come. So three weeks later, he flew his wife home, got his toolkit and came back. And, um, as it turns out, and this is a nice story, I'll keep it short. I was away training in feng shui in the Netherlands on the week he arrived. So it was frustrating me a little bit because he wasn't there or I wasn't there to sort of be part of it. So he had the drawings, the slab was already prepared, the concrete slab, but because it was based on a golden spiral, it was rectangular, but the spiral was there. In the curing of the concrete, we had placed a whole string of crystals in the concrete. And underneath the, the vanishing point, the center of the spiral, we had a very large quartz crystal, all invisible at this point. So um, just before I flew, I left a big, huge cans candle, about a foot and a half high candle on that spot, fully presuming that the, the candle would blow out that night. But it didn't. It stayed going. I flew early in the morning, the same day that Mel arrived on site. And when he saw the candle there, he couldn't work out what the hell was going on. But he had a feeling, and I, this is leading somewhere. He had a feeling something was going on. So the first thing he did was little build a frame around it to keep the flame alive, to stop the wind blowing out the candle. And he thought, is it, a, is it to stop mosquitoes? You know, is it uh, some sort of signal? He went through the logical things, but nothing made sense. So he just said, protect it. So um, I was back a week later and the structure was up. And, uh, 
And then I said, how could you do this in a week? He just said, well, that's what I do. So I said, okay, remember everything was stick frames, straight lines. That was fine. But then I showed him some designs I'd been doing for clients where I couldn't find a builder with more curves. And he said, I've never done curves, but I'd love to give it a go. And this is a man who's 65 years old at this point. So I, I introduced him to the client and the client was open and said, okay, we've no choice at this point. Let's do it. And cut a long story short, he ended up building about 200 homes in Ireland over the next 15 years. But he attracted to him young men from Estonia. And uh, I know Estonia could seem like some alien landscape now to many people listening, but Estonia is a small country in the Balkans adjacent to Russia. And uh, uh, so wonderful craftsmen, young, young men in their early 20s came with no experience. Mel taught them how to hold a hammer, how to work with the timber. So every night they would sit down and have a beer and cook together while they were working. And they would try to work out how to curve the timber, how to do it in a way that makes sense. We didn't have a steamer. They didn't want to waste material. So if you can imagine, you've got a curved wall and my fingers at the timber frame. So here's the floor. These are the timber frame. It's on a curve. So you, you need a wall plate, which is the base onto which these timbers go. Probably two layers of timber as a wall plate, two as a top plate. And you imagine these curves, you're going to have to get a really thick piece of timber, 12 by 2 or 14 by 2. You're going to have to make two cuts, and then you've got a huge amount of wasted timber. So they said that's a waste. First of all, we don't have this timber. We need to work with the six by twos or the four by twos, how to do it. So a few beers later, they came up with a concept whereby, how can I demonstrate this to you? Hold on. Um, okay. I'm just going to hold this up. It's a phone. It's a nicely uh, bro broken screen. Don't mind that. So let's say this is a, a piece of wood. Just imagine it longer. Now, if we were to do a wall plate, you'd have to cut here and then yeah. cut here. And there's lots of weightage and effort. Or you take some sort of chipboard or OSB or plywood and you cut layer after layer after layer, huge amount of time, energy, and the cost. So what the guys did, they would take this four by two or six by two. So imagine this is longer, okay? Mm -hmm. They would make, they would establish the radius, which I would give them. They would make one cut from all the way to the left, quite close to the top and back down again. So I'm exaggerating here, but just one cut yeah. on the timber. And they would now have a bottom part and a top part. So they would take off the top part and shunk, put it on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So you have a curve here yeah. and you have a con concave here and a convex here. And because this is going to be a wall plate, it's very good. It's not, it's not intention. Yeah. So they would just literally take the top half, put it at the bottom, nail, nail, nail. That makes sense. And they've got a wall plate. So think of it as so simple. And I remember myself on my own house, myself and one young Estonian, we did 1.1 miles of linear wall plate and top plates for my house in one day using only a skill saw and all the timber just lined up beside us. Think of that. That's like 1.6 kilometers, like 1.8 kilometers. That's that's an unbelievable amount of timber curves. But because it was a lot for a straight wall. <laughs> unbelievable. And we just did, and so literally we had about 17 different radii. Yeah. And we stacked them up, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and the radii. And literally it became Lego. It became IKEA. It became easy peasy. Mm -hmm. And this complex timber frame was up in several weeks. Not one straight line, everything curvy. Then you introduce all these curves in the vertical, then you introduce a curved roof, which is like a skeleton, and suddenly you just bring them all together. You bring the walls that are there, meeting the ceiling, what's missing? Add a little bit extra. So these, these walls just come up to meet the beams, and suddenly you, you insulate it, you wire it, you plumb it, you plasterboard it, drywall it, Sure. You render it, and you've got a sacred building. You've got curved walls. So they did this repeatedly, and every client was ending up paying the same per square foot as they would for a conventional normal building, give or take. Now, they, it might end up costing more because of their choice of materials and finishes and how fancy the kitchen was. 
but in terms of the primary structure, it was the equivalent of a normal build. And we discovered that it was structurally stronger because you know, if you take an egg, of course. and you can squish an egg in that direction, you turn it horizontally, you can squish it easily, but vertically, because all the stresses follow this line. Yeah. So we were building these structures that didn't need steel, that didn't need these big um, glue laminated beams because you'd have a dome in the middle and then the roof would extend from yeah, that. Yeah. Well, curved so, wall is self-buttressing too. It just stays it's up. Self-buttressing, yeah. For, if that doesn't mean much to your listeners, a buttress is a second level support. So if there's a wall here that looks like it might fall for whatever reason, you would buttress it with some support or you'd have to make it stronger or thicker. But when you have a curved wall where the stresses of their own self weight or snow load or wind naturally follow the shape of the building. It follows the, the line of the structure effortlessly. So you need less materiality to create greater structural integrity. So after, so we can reliably say that after hundreds of these buildings, the cost was comparable with conventional builds, differing only in the choice of materials, which is the client's choice. So, however, Mel has finally retired in his 80s. The young Estonians have moved on. So there is a bit of a, a gap in the story. There right, will, when do I start? Yeah, yeah. There does need to be a reinvention. <laughs> of some of sorts you know well it's interesting because i spent all my time working with you know round wood and trees and we yeah. get curves from the tree that already has a curve and then we work with that with the design and and i like that a lot um and then yeah. i spend a lot of time working on you know commercial construction framing crews and everything's straight it's got to be straight 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 because it's fast um yeah. But I like what you're doing because it's kind of it's in the middle, you know. Yeah. And so you're yeah, still yeah. you still have your studs and your kind of more standard wall system, but you're still getting these beautiful curves and you can do any geometry. It's, so it's wonderful. And then, and then when the guys do this, just the framing, all the other trades can come along, and there's no they're not going to be embarrassed in the, in their ignorance. They're not going to be challenged. There's no ego involved. They come back and of course there is the builder's rhetoric. What the hell's going on here, guys? You know, can you not build straight? Were you drunk when you built it? You know, the architect must be stoned. You know, all of these playful things, you know. But once they get into it, they realize that they're still plumbing a wall. They're still plastering. They're still, you know, the same trades that they apply, but they would end up feeling good because now they did something new. They did something unusual and they're proud. So. Um, I've had this with commercial projects many times where the builders were cursing me in the beginning, but then subsequently were thanking me that they never felt like their job was really that worthwhile. They did it to put food on the table, but for the first time, they actually felt it meant something. Um, yeah. There's an extreme in this. There is a builder I worked with in um, Brisbane in uh, East uh, Australia and a very unusual house. It was in the shape of a seed and they, they they were a relatively wealthy client in fairness so it was a large house on beautifully landscaped property and uh they did everything for it they got a lot of materials from bali and they shipped them in so they found a builder who had never done anything before like this but he magnificently rose to the occasion but i met him some years later in australia and he actually i said how are you feeling that you must be proud and he said, I was, but he said, I've had several years of depression. And I said, look, I'm really sorry to hear that. Is this pre-existing? Pre and he said, no, it's because of the building. And I said, please tell me why this is important. And he said, because now I know that this is possible. I find it hard to accept anything less. So he wasn't getting clients like that I anymore. I heard that, man. I heard that. Yeah. So, yeah. You could just say, oh, feck it, it's just life, you know, another one will come along. Yeah. But for his particular personality profile, it, it led to depression. So, you know, he just said, do you have any other clients here at all within 100 kilometers, you know? And I said, look, not at the moment, but if you find one, we'll do it together, you know? Um, but so that's the other extreme, where once a door opens, it doesn't close again when you realize 
I'm sure you and your clients and the people you've worked for and helped create magic with, they could never go back. Now, if they do choose to leave the building, it's because they want to do it even a more amazing one. Because, uh, you know, you just can't go back when you realize this is possible. And uh, that's why it's not for the faint hearted. You know, um, many of your listeners and viewers would be well aware of cymatics. Um, cymatics is the study of vibration. Do you think they would? Shall I spend 10 seconds? I mean, anybody can look it up and it it's applies to everything we've been talking about. You mentioned it a few times. It has to do with if you see the sand on like a metal plate and they turn Vibrated. the frequency of the sound, they'll turn it up and down. And in there, there are certain frequencies of sound where you get different geometric shapes in the sand due Absolutely. to the sound, due to the um, standing waves in the sand, basically. Yeah. So you get these complex symmetries that are a, a visualized reality of the sonic or electronic patterns that are um, impacting it vibrationally, blah, blah, blah. But we are currently, as a people, going through a cymatic upgrade. Now, if you were to see a cymatic video on YouTube, and there's many of them, you will see that these individual particles begin to dance and vibrate when they start to acknowledge the first tune. So there's a random smattering of these particles, be it sand or like a podium or pollen, whatever. The plate starts to vibrate. The standing waves begin to generate and all the particles continue to find their natural place, the path of least resistance to the nearest standing wave. And when you look from above, you see these lovely symmetries. However, if you take a photograph, it's a snapshot of a beautiful pattern. And you could say that's the pattern of 320 hertz you know, of, of, of frequency vibration, bang. But if you see it as a video, you'll notice that even though it looks like it's a fixed pattern, you zoom in and you see that all the particles are continuously moving and interchanging positions and dancing around the entire plate, but the pattern remains the same. Mm -hmm. Now, if you introduce a new signal or a higher frequency or a more complex pattern, or a more complex uh, sonic or electromagnetic pattern, what happens is that the previous pattern can no longer hold its, in, its integrity because there's no longer a song that's giving it form. So what happens is that at the edges of the pattern, the, the particles that are more free to move, they begin to dance to the new tune. So there is this expression that those that hear the music are thought to be crazy by those who can't. So if you hear someone, and if you see someone in the street and they're just dancing like a mad person, if they're hearing music, it's perfectly natural, but you think they're crazy. So cymatically, we we're going- to. Yeah. <laughs> Cym yeah, assuming they haven't taken any experimental medicines, okay. But um, uh, another subject. So can you imagine that in the rising of consciousness of humanity, if such a thing can be imagined, then especially in this time, that it's those particles or people on the edge that are beginning to move in response to the new signal. And all the other particles that are entrenched and fixed and uh, <clears throat> holding in a holding pattern that is about the old, they of course will take, come back here, you're crazy. You know, what are you doing? So you're one of those particles. I'm one of those particles. Arturo and Dan and Lydia and Zana, all of these people, we are all parts of these particles that are on the edge because we begin to hear the new music. You can call that particular song sacred architecture or bio something design. You know, you can, whatever the word you feel comfortable with, it's a song that we are beginning to feel. And we know, how can we not dance to this new tune? It's in our bones, it's in our DNA. It's calling to us every day to get up and do something for it. So in this concept, it becomes self-evident. So eventually, more and more of the particles will be dancing the new tune. So we won't be seeking for clients that are hopefully got the resources necessary for us to do what we love to do. That's already our experience that they're coming to us without business cards or Instagram or any sort of interface. They'll just find their way to us because it's resonance. So if you're primarily, primarily set to generate, create, manifest, procure beauty in all that you do, that is going to attract to it 
people, resources, opportunities, situations, locations that are already listening to that same music. And this has nothing to do with supply chain issues and, and uh, threats of war and all this drama that is threatening to, to diminish who we are. We focus on the beauty, focus on this cymatic potential. And what we can't do is just amazing. You know, what we, what we will do together. So, you know, that's, it's a wonderful. I heard that. Absolutely. Man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that. But yeah. ultimately, any project can begin because as Dan Winter says, coherence at one level is coherence at all levels. If the overall structural integrity of a complex pattern is based on natural symmetry, geometry, form, then if you induce um, coherent signal at one level, it will fractally distribute throughout the whole. So <clears throat> if someone comes to you for a very small job, a kitchen makeover in an existing apartment, you might put your head down and say, my God, this is a far cry from a you know, <clears throat> biogeometry house in the middle of a pristine forest next to a waterfall. Oh my God, when will I get the break? But you take that project and you functionally and fractally throw all of your resources and energy and attributes and skills and knowledge into it, and you will create some seed of beauty. And you put all of that in there, and that doesn't go nowhere. That's a double negative, specifically and intentionally, because it goes <laughs> to Yeah, yeah, I agree. It, it's, a, it's a fractal attractor. It initiates a response that begins to feed like butterfly effect. And, uh, and when you're ready, the opportunity will present, be it in the form of a teacher, a mentor, a client. Like I remember when I first went out on my own back in the mid to late 90s, um, it was a bit scary. I had two kids and a sizable mortgage and no certainty of any work. And uh, it was a little bit of a nervous time. But um, a developer who had worked with the company I had worked for, he had commissioned them for large projects. Even though I had no direct interface with him during the running of my previous job, um, he was a clever, astute man, and he knew who was doing the work, even though it had been uh, carried through by someone senior to me. So, um, cut a long story short, he approached me once and said, uh, I'd like you to do something for me. And I thought it might be a freebie, you know, like a, they call it a mixer, like um, he's sort of... Freebie. Freebie, yeah, like do it for nothing just because I'm I'm Bro important. Boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but at that point, I wasn't saying no to anything. So, he did give me something for it. It was a relatively small job, but I think in hindsight, he was just testing our working relationship. Cut a long story short, yeah. he ended up being my patron, um, like the the Medici family with Michelangelo. Yeah. Now, for listeners, I'm not saying I'm Michelangelo. I'm just Michael. But uh, the, the, the point is, it was that dynamic. So all of his projects, he came to me for. Hotels, nightclubs, golf courses. Oh, yeah. You need that. Yeah, you need yeah. someone like that. Wow. And, uh, and it was a fantastic because there was no sort of interview process. He just said, I bought a property up the road. I'll meet you there at six in the morning. You don't say no. You turn up. I started getting images straight away. He let me do it. And uh, I would produce a model and a drawings and he'd say, yeah, show it to the builder, off you go, you know, and uh, un you unbelievable, go. you know, so that's, that's why I managed to have so many projects in the background, because uh, it was a very, when you, I should say this for your listeners, that uh, whether they be designers, builders, whatever, when you start to work like this, you end up getting very busy, meaning that you, it starts to build its own energy but it's more and more efficient. So I remember one, one, one couple came to me and as they walked in the door, I was Im immediately reminded of a dream that I had had the previous night. And I was, at a, I was in a lighthouse and I was looking from the top of a lighthouse looking down and the rocks were arranged in a certain geometry as I could see and the water was coming in. It was a very interesting dream that wasn't sparked by something I'd watched or eaten. It was off quite left field. And uh, when they walked in the door, I just got that image again. I had kind of forgotten the dream and the waking up and breakfast with the kids and stuff. But the dream came back. I said nothing. 
But they started speaking about what they wanted to build. And he just said, he was a very tall individual. And he just said, look, as you can see, I'm a tall guy. And I just like to have an overview. I like that feeling of being able to see the land. And, um, and I said, like, you're in a lighthouse. And she burst out laughing. She said, yeah. He just said, if this guy can design a lighthouse, we're in. And I said, like a lighthouse. So suddenly he was in and, and I designed it and so on. So because I said something like this and I sketched it right in front of them and held it up. And uh, they just said, that's it. You know, I did the layout of the building based on the geometry of the rocks. And then one component was a tower. And they just said, that's it. And I gave them my fee, which was a very reasonable fee. Um, but then, of course, his business energy kicked in and said, listen, I was there. You designed this in less than five minutes. Yet you're looking for X amount of money for the service. So I said, uh, you know, do you think I should charge you more for not wasting my, your time? You know, it's <laughs> a good answer. Yeah, yeah. So the point being here is not that I'm super quick. It's that when you start operating like this, uh, you're limited only by the speed of transmission of the idea, meaning how quickly can you show this to them to get a yes? Most architects would spend meeting after meeting after meeting to tune the design and adjust it and discuss it and then go and research something and come back with another proposal. 95% of the first ideas that come are the ones that get built with some minor tuning, like the ensuite needs to be slightly bigger, or what about a, a walk-in wardrobe? That type of tuning. Now, that's an unbelievably successful hit rate. So either I'm brilliant, or this process is naturally arising when you open to it. I'm humble enough to acknowledge that I have opened to certain levels of skill through intense practice over the years, but I wouldn't use the word brilliant. I would say that the more I align with these principles, the more efficient the process becomes. Mm -hmm. And the more you can subtly feel, like if you've ever done a martial art, like uh, Wing Chun or Aikido. Are where you're in ah, yeah, okay. So um, I did for decades as well and recently got into Wing Chun. So, you know, you're, 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 you're feeling the movement of the, of the opponent, but the opponent is basically an opportunity for you to develop sensitivity. So the moment you sense there's a, a movement of the center of gravity, uh, an impulse, a move, a, a push or a pull, and you can adapt accordingly to an intended goal. It's the same thing. So if you open up to a design, even before you meet the client, you might just start getting images. But let's say in a linear, acceptable way, you've met the clients, they've described their vision. And in the, in, in the driving home afterwards or after they leave, you might get an image. And it could be the image of, of, of a sunflower seed or a boat or, um, uh, you know, a, a flag blowing in the wind. Don't dismiss it. This is the unknown knocking on the door. And you hold this. So I would invite the clients to say, listen, in the contemplation of this home, meaning when you close your eyes and just imagine what it'd be like to live in your home and all the feelings that that brings up for you, does anything arise? It could be an image, a sensation, a color, a, a, a memory. doesn't matter. Don't hold on to it. Don't try to spiritualize it. Just see what comes up. And nine out of 10 clients will say, okay, this is a bit weird. Are you sure we're not in a psychology class here instead of an architecture <laughs> office? But uh, they say, and then he laughs and says, okay, I got the image of a boat, a little rowing boat. That's mad. You know? And then she says, I got my hair much longer, but blowing in the wind. I'm giving this as a real example of a couple that came to me years sure. ago. So the shape of the building was a boat, but the, the structures behind it, the bedrooms were all curving off that. Like a, so we took that as a literal meaning in this case. Sometimes it can be metaphoric or symbolic or um, something that ends up being a piece of art. But uh, in this case, it was a lit, and in many cases, it became a literal genesis of the geometric matrix. It became, so like, what is the geometry of a wave? Is it a golden wave? Is it a fractal wave? Is the first wave 1.618 times the length of the next? You know, um, is it a wave that, that comes to a zero point or does it, is it continuous? And the rowing boat is a beautiful because a boat needs to move through the medium of water. So it's, a, it's an efficient shape. It's a beautiful, organic, efficient shape designed to cut through stuff. So it's a gorgeous shape to work with. You can see when you start working poetically and symbolically, 
but you ne but you have the necessary rigor and scientific is a loose word here but mathematical or geometrical or um, structural sense of what this symbol could mean in real terms then that's a perfect recipe for natural emergence and then the design just falls onto the page countless times i realize that i'm limited only by how quickly i can draw you know yeah. and how much information so we having said that and it's important to hear especially because the new generation is using computers and ai and interfacing with all this realm there is a, a direct connection between your eyes and your hand because your arm your hand this is golden ratio golden ratio golden ratio golden ratio golden ratio to here to here to here when you draw with your hand there is a dynamic that's at play that's physical physiological psychological energetic spiritual you name it and yeah. all of these together are operating so that truth has a smooth transition from the field to the form and uh, this is wonderful if many architects it's cheaper for them in an architectural firm to hire three or four CAD technicians, computer-aided design technicians and renderers and 3D guys instead of a really good designer. Mm, yeah. Okay. So they're throwing peanuts at these boys who throw out, throw out these photorealistic with the BMW, with the sun, the sun glare on the window outside this modern monstrosity. And, uh, and the client is wowed because it looks wow. But there's no depth of design in it. There's no neuroesthetic understanding. There's no sacred proportions. Not they just soul. no soul, like an AI-generated <laughs> art. You just yeah. think, "Holy shit!" When I see this, it's so complex. I could keep zooming into it, but there's no soul. Yes. So I'm not a luddite. That word means anti-technology. At best, it should be a tool that we use consciously. At best, but uh, in this case, if we don't allow for this poetic interface with our soul and our capacity to express it, communicate it, apply it, which is like drawings. Of course, once the design is fixed, we draw it on computer. We use AutoCAD as a flat drawing, not 3D modeling, because as you probably saw already, our 3D hands drawings are like computer drawings. You know, they're very realistic sketches, you know? That's just a skill learned and, and, and developed. Point being that uh, this magic, I'll use the word quite friendly word, yeah. This magic of symbolic interface with the higher senses, if you give it a capacity and a conduit for expression, it provides all the difference. And that's where things happen that are non-linear. So it's much quicker. The idea comes, you hold it like a newborn baby, don't over explain it, just let it express. Pretty soon it's walking, running and developing and the design is there. You give it to the client, nine times out of 10, if not 95 times out of 100, they'll say, oh my God, this is nothing like what we imagined, but we love it. Let's do it. And that's it. And then the planners and the municipal coding requirements and all the rest, they also come along and something in them activates. Many... Uh, officials that work in the coding offices and the building companies, not companies, but uh, departments and so on, the planners, we call them planners. They, um, many of them wanted to be designers, but didn't quite make it for one reason or another. So there is a part of their soul that yearns to create. So if they don't have an opportunity to create, unfortunately, it is an aspect of human psychology that it's easier to knock something down. I don't mean physically but to, to not support something if you can't actually be part of its creation. I know in the States, you can pretty much build anything you want as long as it's up to code. But in Europe, um, more, or less. more or less, you know, I mean, if it's, if it's not Very too Very restrictive uh, building codes and building departments in certain places. No, no, for sure. I get that in terms of how you build and what you build, but you could get away with something crazier than most of Europe, for example, in terms of the design. Okay. But uh, in many cases in Europe, it's, you're just not allowed to build anywhere other than in the city environments, point. And they're just saying no to everybody, even if you have your own land, which is generational land. Really? So wow. well, it's part of the bullshit World Economic Forum agenda, you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. We won't, we won't go there today. <laughs> but uh, 
just knocking down people's capacity to create their own realities in their own way. Anyway, I don't want to digress. The point is that when municipal agents have seen these unusual buildings, something in them said yes. Something in them support it. Sure. They want to support it. Yeah. If they can't do it themselves, they for sure want to be part of its creation. And uh, so I got a bit of a reputation in Ireland of being getting planning permission in places which was never imagined. So normally that would be assumed that I was somehow friendly with the planners or I played golf with them or they were in receipt of brown paper bags with some cash in it. No, um, it, was, it was quite simply that I wasn't nervous beforehand of what would the planners think, nor was I arrogantly presuming that they didn't matter. I realized that in real world mechanics, their yes was vital for the procurement of the final building. So how can you make it in such a way for the planner to say yes? So you can initially engage with them and say, we want to create something a little unusual, but we would wish for your help because your job is to you know, define what would be appropriate here. So you would use their own language and their own guidelines and the wordings that they use um, in their documentation and website and their regulatory frameworks and uh, use that not against them, but for them. You would say, you can see here with this design that we were seeking to ABC, which is in their document, build something in keeping with the local environment or traditional building, you know? And uh, bah, bah, bah. so this is the equivalent of non-violent communication. You know, it's basically observing or stating a reality that you wish to manifest and inviting them to be part of that. So some part of them knows that if they say yes, it'll come back to them somehow, you know? And that conversation is never direct. It's an energetic flow. So it's yet another example of the efficiency and functionality of this way of doing designing and building. So we talked about less materials, structurally stronger, um, as quick or simple, uh, singularly priced in such a way that is comparable with tra traditional buildings, getting permission, less meetings with the client, you yeah. know, dot, 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 dot. Well, and your, your systems, your wall systems and your drawings are all going to fit within the parameters that are acceptable. Exactly. And if you tick those boxes, but still do something beautiful, everybody wins. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, you probably have loads of questions. I'm, I'm, I take oh, of over. Of course I do. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know how much time you have more today, but, you know, I wanted to get into also some of these other designs I'm working on right now. I mean, this for example, I mean, this summer I've got a, a straw bale building I'm working on for a client and then uh, doing a little root cellar for a community yes. garden group that's, uh, it should be pretty interesting, pretty hobbity kind of look that they want. So that that's all good stuff. But, um, and I'll do a couple of workshops probably for something in there. Um, on top of this, uh, I'm doing a bioarchitecture work workshop this summer. That's the first bioarchitecture workshop I'm teaching. And that'll just be like a design overview for the students, um, you know, incorporating everything I've learned so far, which is quite a bit of information packed into uh, a few weekends and then a hands-on weekend, you know, doing some cob and buildings, scale models of buildings. So a lot awesome. of fun stuff planned, but um, one of the main things that keeps coming up for me recently is uh, temple design. It's like a whole nother topic. You know, um, I talked with Lydia and Arturo. We brought up the concept of hormesis, you know, which is that a small amount of, say, poison, whether it be chemical or, you know, from waves or geomagnetic forces, you know, your, your mm -hmm. different locations on the earth that are actually uh, can cause sickness, you know, because of the geomagnetics, a small amount of that makes you more healthy, <laughs> it makes you stronger. So this concept of hormesis is used in a lot of the temples, like Lydia went around and she studied all these different temples, she did measure dozens of different variables at all these locations and found a lot of correlation that, um, you know, the megalithic sites and the temple sites um, around the world, they have certain, let's say, geopathology that mm -hmm. wouldn't be a good location to build a house. 
so you know looking at it okay there's two different lines of uh of design there's the home where you don't want geopathology and then there's the temple where a little bit of geopathology or some is okay because it's for a small dosage of the yep. user to go in there and get some healing for a visit not to sleep there every night so anyway so after you know after meeting dan and then learning about the therify and experiencing the therify I realized like there's really something here. I, there's, if you try the Therify out, I recommend it to everybody. Um, therify.net, I believe it is. You'll see that it, it's emitting the cascading frequencies. You should spell it out because it sounds like Terrify, as in I'm terrified of something. Just yes. spell, spell it out for all. Right. Therify, T H E R A P H I. So Phi as in Phi golden ratio therify so therapy yeah, so I'll, put the, I'll put the link in the description yes that's the best idea yeah just along with it. with our websites and all the in links to our courses and so mm -hmm. therify is producing a series of frequencies that really kind of mimic some of the most um healing places on earth and also what they record around you know giant pyramids like the great pyramids and the bosnian pyramids and they have been known to create some effects, you know, causing healing or lucid dreaming or, you know, it's, it's kind of at its infancy that the measurement yeah. science of this, but the Therify definitely does something I can personally attest to experiencing um, interesting healing and interesting effects around this thing. So after experiencing Therify and connecting with Dan about this technology, I realized, well, what if we built a temple building that could work in conjunction with the Therify device mm -hmm. and or maybe work separately but have the same type of approach and same type of frequency so that led me down a long path you know I've been reading uh, Schwaller de Lubitz and uh, you know I found this really interesting book that's uh, Alexander Bad Badawi this is the uh, ancient Egyptian architectural design and and then just researching a lot about ancient temples yeah. and thinking about, you know, what is it that they're doing? What are the consistent things that they're doing? So anyway, I want you to look at uh, some of the design that I've come up with so far. And we can talk a little bit about the geometry sure. just briefly. Um, so the basic design is, is this. It's the, this is a pyramid with a 76.345 degree angles at the base. Okay, is it four sided? Is, is it four sided? Is it a square yeah. base? Yeah, yeah, okay. Very square good. base. This is the door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. And then inside of this, what I'm thinking so far is either either something like a torus, like you know, this is this is my model here, this apple. Mm -hmm. This yeah, is yeah. the torus. So this is this this is the secondary room inside the pyramid. And mm -hmm. you would enter in here and the Therify device would be in there with the practitioner. Nice. Um, and, or it could be more like an egg shape. So <clears throat> this gourd represents my, my egg shaped dome that would be inside of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. So you would go through one and then go into this inner chamber. So this, this kind of basic concept of creating a, a series of shells um, mm -hmm. that you see even, you know, with like Kepler and the, and Dan talks a lot about the Icasa Dodeca uh, three-dimensional fractal series. That's like, I guess it's the only 3D fractal series uh, that you see in the Star it, Mother yeah. kit. Um, yeah. So just getting to, you know, what types of forms are going to create the most effect for possibly healing, regeneration, recalibration <laughs> of the human being. Um, yeah. and we, we have recorded energy readings, especially from the 76.345 degrees uh, pyramids, these steep pyramids, and also the same angle is used on the Great Pyramids at the top of the peak. Um, I've seen photographs, for example, of sort of like a St. Elmo's fire looking like glow coming off of some of these pointy pyramids. Um, and I think, I think that's real. You know, they're, they're essentially like concentrating charge or negative ions um gathering charge from the atmosphere Absolutely. and it concentrates at the tip mm -hmm. so i mean yeah. 
I have a lot of questions, but <laughs> basically, you know, if you go inside this thing, it, it definitely does something. And I mentioned this to Dan. He said, well, the greatest effect is at the tip. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this, this may be alterable. I mean, maybe it, maybe it looks like this, you know, maybe you have uh, yeah. the pyramid yeah. and then the chamber is up here, up on top of it. So the, anyway, we're kind of playing around with some of this geometry. I'm curious what your reaction would be. Well, the, let's say you built a two-story structure and the pyramid was downstairs and then you, you had a container. So you have exactly. a projector and a container or the pyramid could be underground. Exactly. So uh, in this point, you've got, um, so look, when you take my finger, you've got this length here. Let's call that one. And then from that knuckle to this knuckle is 0.618 times that. Right. One, 0.618, 0.618, 0 0.618. So this even just in the body, that's why when you do this, your fingertips make a spiral, a golden spiral. So Tai Chi masters or Qi Gong masters and so on, they can literally point their finger and they're able to focus their charge fields, their plasma across the so-called separation between bodies. And I first experienced this in my early 20s where a friend who wasn't my teacher, he was my friend, but he was a Kung Fu teacher at the time at the university. And uh, he pointed at my forehead from about seven or eight feet away and I felt pressure on my third eye. So I didn't even know what the hell a third eye was at the time and I wasn't expecting this, but I definitely felt pushed off, off balance. So nature does project charge when it has a chance to do so. So Dan talks about um, Indiana Jones's whip, you know, the whip, because it goes from a long wave and because it's a finite length, the long wave becomes a shorter wave, shorter wave, shorter wave, shorter wave, until the tip makes that cracking noise because it, it goes faster than the speed of sound. It breaks the sound barrier. 700 and something miles an hour. So how does your arm that's going that slow do it? Because of this cascading effect. So when you have a concentration of, when you can accumulate charge or uh, provide a pathway for the charge that's normally in a healthy distribution, flow movement, you give that charge a chance to coalesce and then to come into focus. And, yet, and then you don't break it up along the way with um, crappy materials or broken points and you let it smoothly reach a point, it will create a chi flow for lack of a better description. It can create um, an information energetic flow. Now, what's doing that? That's the living planet that's basically dynamically dancing. But if you bring that into a space like a flow of negative ions and then you provide a container of that, like an egg shape, a dome of some description, that you're literally filling that space, that cave, that environment with the produce of this charge accumulation. Within that, your consciousness. Now, you can leave that space empty. And you don't know what's going on. It's Schrodinger's cat. Is it dead or alive? You can put in some measurement in there, which is measuring that the negative ion count is 10,000 times more than it is outside the building. That's an interesting result. But then you go in there. If it is part of your journey to heal, then your consciousness can invite you to a place where that can flow in such a way that the result will be what you call healing. So in that space, you will have manifested an opportunity to be in a space that you get reminded of what flow is. You get reminded of what it is to feel the capacity to hold charge in a way that I'm not leaking it away with my negative thoughts or my low immune system or my victim mentality. Or just what by that? wearing shoes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm talking psychologically, but absolutely by yeah. wearing rubber, rubber shoes, you're insulating yourself from the effect or um, crappy materials in your clothes, you know? Yeah. But ultimately, you could wear shoes made out of garbage and plastic bag on your head. If your consciousness is ready for change, you'll do it in a police cell, yeah. in, a jail, in a jail room. So we must remember that. That's true. We must remember that that's what consciousness can do anytime, anywhere. However, most of us are battling just to stay conscious, you know, sure. considering the quality of our food, our air, our water, our neighbors, you name it. That's before you get into all the bullshit going on. 
So the point is that uh, we need to support our systems. And if you go into these pristine spaces whose intention and construction come together in such a way that this experience is possible, wonderful. And then you introduce the Terrifier, another healing device. It's not a healing device. It's a device that is running according to its, its, its in invented construction protocol. But the results of which is that consciousness gets reminded who it is. And that that does the work. It doesn't work if your consciousness resists the healing. True. You know? Yeah, true. It's, yeah, so. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more of an assistant. It's like uh, listening to a song. You could listen to the same song on different days, and some days you feel nothing, and other days you feel inspired by it. So it. No, there was actually, there was actually, uh, back to those five years I spoke about before, where Zana asked me, how do you know bioarchitecture works? Right. I, I happily spoke about the clients who are loving their houses. And she just gently asked me, were there any clients who didn't? And then I realized that I was only friendly with the ones that were still living there and still happy. And that I, that was not the basis of a scientific assessment. I was absolutely cherry picking the responses because the buildings that are based in sacred geometry, all these hundreds of houses, for whatever reason, they were manifested by these clients as something they needed in their life at this time. That's, a, that's understandable. Mm -hmm. No one knows how long we're going to live anywhere because we could drop dead tomorrow or some opportunity could arise. So many people believe this is it. This is my dream home. I'm done. But who knows? Many things can happen. I know that from personal experience. Point being that maybe what you needed was a major growth experience which could come in the form of a death in the family or a sickness or a, an unexpected opportunity to go somewhere or a decision to leave, that you would then say, well, that building wasn't very sacred, was it? Like you were only there six months and then you left or you got sick. Whereas Mr. Nice was a healthy architecture now. But maybe the sickness, what we call sickness, that's another story. Like what is sickness? It's an opportunity to tune yourself into betterment. Um, maybe that sickness, for lack of a better word, was your consciousness saying, look, you've been doing computer science for 15 years because your parents told you it was a good job opportunity, but actually you want to be a tattoo artist. You know, in your life, there was something else going on. Maybe yeah. you got the mortgage to build a house because you've got a good computer job, but is your soul singing every time you go to work? Many people build a beautiful house because they want to have something special when they come home to after their mundane existence in the corporate realm. So you can see that when we start looking back a little bit, you know, we just think, what's really going on here? Um, I got sick after I moved into my sacred design house. What the hell? Yeah, that's great insight. I mean, it's good to look at things open, open mindedly mm -hmm. that everything happens for a reason, but we don't know what the reasons are necessarily. Um, Look, I, I'm well aware of the new ageism. You know, everything happens for a reason, man. Just chill out, you know? It's in good hands, trust the plan. No, that's a cop-out. We need to take full responsibility for our actions, of course, and do the best we can in each moment. But to acknowledge that if we start saying, that's a sacred building, those three are not, because the science tells me, trust the science. Where Look where that has got us. Sure, sure. So what I'm saying is that consciousness is what we ultimately serve. Consciousness is what we're seeking to express. Consciousness is what's calling us to do something beautiful. Sure. If consciousness is served and the evolution of the expression of that consciousness is served through the application of these techni technologies and techniques and protocols and beliefs and understandings, then great. But we shouldn't be too rigid. We shouldn't assume that because I measured the capacitive charge in that building, it's sacred and that isn't. Says who? Says the machine. You trust the machine? Well, all you all you measured was capacitance. You can't measure sacredness because, like you're saying, it's due to the uh, the user, the, yeah. the person there. It's like it's like if you had a musical instrument. It's like well, the instrument could be well made and could be great, but different people will play different songs and yeah, 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 yeah. and maybe that last of coherence was necessary for your system to remember that it's screwed up, <laughs> you know, sure. to have an experience that, so 
that's been a yeah, valuable. I, I appreciate your perspective on that, and I I think that it, it's both. You know, it's it's this very esoteric process, and then also there's certain um, external things that I think we're honing in on right now. It's like when you look at these ancient uh, the vimanas, the temples in India around the world, also like the seventy six point three four five degree pyramid is used over and over again and i think there's some reason why and i don't think it's a nefarious reason <laughs> you know i i have this deep feeling that there's some you know there's some clues here left by the ancients to show us like hey this is a tool that helped us and you, you you analyze the shape and it's like you can fit if you fit a series of spheres inside of this shape you know each sphere the one on top of the next will be in golden ratio relationship to one yeah. another so it's like we we're just at the infancy of understanding the the fabric of our reality and simultaneously our consciousness but these mm -hmm. um like geometric and physical aspects i think kind of help us focus in for a minute and say well you know this this can work you know this is something that has proven to at least help in some way so Look, that's kind of where i'm at with it we we have done our own research and I don't mean YouTube, we literally two years ago, Zan and I, we drove across Europe when everybody told us we can't, it's not safe, there's a lockdown happening. And we said, sorry, that's not our reality. And we drove something like 14,000 kilometers, like give or take 8,000 miles, um, 11 different countries. And we were specifically traveling to discover what are called star forts. And these are yeah. starship structures that are called military fortifications, which is bullshit, you know? So we're of the opinion without knowing for certain but we're of the current opinion that these structures were everything except what they are being pretended, pretended to be um just some sort of historic military installation that they were of these geometric precision designs and forms and shapes because they were somehow harvesting the energy of the earth they were harvesting and tuning and producing um purified water energized water and distributing that over vast networks and that this is not ancient 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 i think that the history that we learn in school is wholly inaccurate i think the time scale that we talk about that you see on the history channel and the um, national geographic is vastly misleading whether deliberately or intentionally or, or accidentally doesn't matter but i think our history is very 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 different and in the past the structures that we are now seeing that how come I never saw this before? This is an unbelievable structure. You know, is it just because everyone is taking photographs on Instagram? Like, how come that building alone is a masterpiece? And we're celebrating the Eiffel Tower. We're celebrating the Parthenon. We're celebrating a few key structures that are in all the magazines and websites. But this building is every bit as unbelievably complex and coherent, if not more so in a way that I can't even imagine who built it. The stones, the precision, the formulations, the choice of materials, the orientation. So for sure, there's an entire science there, absolutely undiscovered, just hinted at with the remnants of these structures. So yes, um, there is a harvesting of conscious living energy. And because water is effectively alive, and now I know that's a contentious um, proposition, you know, that H2O, like three molecules there, um, are somehow alive, but they can hold the vibration that is synonymous with the patterns of life and memory and consciousness. So if a building is constructed in such a way to harvest and invite and trajectorize and accumulate conscious water, and bring it to the point that it's distributed beautifully uh, to an, an entire landscape for the betterment of life, for the growing of crops and plants and seeds and, and life of all descriptions. Now, that's pretty cool sacred architecture. We've lost that. So when we say the word temple, um, you know, we have a little historical baggage with that terminology because straight away we're thinking religious, perhaps spiritual, we think ritual, right, we think... Right. To me and to us, these buildings were absolutely practical, like no biggie, no big deal. They just knew how to do what they needed to do. So the, they were accumulating etheric energy. They were uh, power generators. They were capacitors. They were um, initiators of possible time machines. 
you know, the capacity to shamanically engage with the living planet so that you're riding the Schumann waves going backwards and forwards in time. You wake up 20 minutes later with full knowing of what happened or is happening somewhere else. That's about information, uninterrupted information flow. And if your environment can invite that, then we can do it effortlessly. Now, the key would be to use all of these structures and, and, and methodologies to tune our own natural abilities to the point that we no longer need the crutch of the environment to do so. Because, uh, you know, we're, we are so ignorant um, of what's possible. We are not even entering kindergarten. And if we start to assume we know too much too quickly, I'm all for knowing quickly. You know, I'm all for spontaneous awareness. I'm not suggesting, yeah, in two generations we'll suddenly get it. It can be got in a second. But if we use the language of science exclusively, we'll only ever be slightly behind the latest set of results that are only specific to that test. You know, they can all point to a principle that will begin to make more sense eventually. But ultimately, let's just do it. That's why I really respect what you've been doing, because you didn't learn something and then applied it. You started doing something out of a natural impulse and then slowly, but maybe not so slowly, realized, wow, this has a reason and a meaning and a generative story that is much richer than I ever would have imagined. So now this, this is a, a wave that can carry you for the next 44 years, you know, to express it in a, in a more conscious way. Sure. You were basically an accidental genius. And now you can take that, uh, that skill and that awareness and carry it more consciously. But don't get bogged down in the science. Um, use it only as a tool for communication. If there is a client or a group of interested people who wish to have a sense of what does this actually mean in real terms? Well, the science would suggest this, this, and this. But in that breath, you can also say, there's also an architect from Ireland who would suggest that that's all fine, but, du, 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 you know? Yeah, yeah. So give, give the full spectrum, you know? And uh, ultimately, it's about beauty. Can you think of something that it's more about than that? Now, beauty not as an affectation. You know, beauty is generally considered as a luxury that we need to put the money into structure, uh, municipal requirements, taxation, materials, payments, insurances, you name it. And at the end, if there's a bit left over, we can throw in a bit of beauty. That's the general perception. That's how it's done, usually, yeah. Okay, there's which is- usually not enough money at the end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, well, listen, we'll, we'll, we'll do a competition next year and maybe a bit of beauty we'll throw in. So that's what has happened. But the point is, if you take beauty as the primary purpose, it seems counterproductive, it seems ridiculous, it seems utopian, but if it becomes your, your um, setting, then everything else makes sense. Everything else will turn out. The functionality, the affordability, the maintenance, all of these things make more sense because can you think of nature as being dysfunctional and be, nature is functional and beautiful at the same time? It doesn't compromise one in the uh, elevation of the other. They're hand in hand. If, if, it can, if, it, if it can achieve a function with a certain series of components and mechanisms, you can be sure it's doing six other things with that same function, as well as being beautiful. You know? Yeah. That's, that's mastery. You know, to initiate a system or sequence in a building that is functional and multifunctional and beautiful, that's mastery. You know, and that's what we should be aiming for. But my point is, and this Zana would back me up on this, that this is the power of beauty. Beauty isn't just an affectation or a secondary consideration. It is a force of the earth. It is a tool of consciousness. It is that which will make all the difference at the end of the day. Because what else do we take with us? Beauty is the word we would give to your plasma field at the moment of death. You know? of a life well lived. Now we're talking. Hey, well said. <laughs> uh, hey, can you tell us about, do you have any classes coming up, Michael? No, uh, I was heavily involved with teaching for decades. And then uh, I took a sojourn away from architecture, continued to tipple away and do it. But for 
best part of seven or eight years in Central and Eastern Europe, I was developing seminars for men and, uh, you know, to find what is their deepest purpose. And I was anchoring it, anchoring it somewhat on the Jungian archetypes of the king, the warrior, the magician, the lover. They became like a structural interface for exploring what it is. Of course, the architecture was still in there as a structure in a way it provided a structure for this movement. So um, I say that not because it's that relevant to our overall discussion here, but the point being that there was decades of teaching sacred geometry, feng shui, bioarchitecture, blah, 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 blah. Then I took all of that knowledge plus the martial art, plus my own life experiences, and then went a little bit on another tra trajectory. And then I realized that I really need to live this in an authentic way because I had begun to realize that um, I was not actually living it. Now, this is a little more personal than might be appropriate in the group here, but I realized that I was able to express it very well. I was able to put on a very good show and it was well meant and it was well intentioned, but I realized that my real life was not fully reflecting that truth. Okay. So rather than try to adjust what I was teaching or pretend a little better, I stopped everything. Sure. And uh, so it was a little dramatic. It's in my nature to all or nothing. So I just stopped. But there have been a few, I wouldn't call them teaching. I would call them more sharing opportunities in moments like this. Um, which, of course, if it's recorded and distributed and it reaches 30 people, that's 30 students. I'm not thinking of myself as their teacher, but there's 30 recipient, recipients of that particular moment of expression. And that can be viewed as teaching. So that's not the question you asked me, but basically there's no formal classes currently organized or intended. Um, how, having said that, very open to there to be something in the future, but it's not something that's really, so right now what's exciting us is continuing to work with people and clients. There's an increasing number of communities that are in fledgling status that don't necessarily have huge resources, but they want something coherent to hold the vision together. And um, so they usually can come together with enough resources to make that happen. Um, the vision, at least, whether it's not built yet. Um, and also, there's a lot of people that are reacting more proactively, but reacting to the various changes that are unfolding on the world stage. And again, without going into obvious details, they're looking to make a, a real life, you know, mm. a sustainable life that isn't necessarily buying into a rhetoric about climate crisis, that are basically, what's, what's sustainable? And Dan Winter would very beautifully say that sustainable and sacred are interchangeable words. We have been brainwashed into thinking sustainable is don't drive your, your car, turn off your light switch. That couldn't be further from the truth. Um, true sustainability is where the wave, in whatever form, is able to re-enter itself non-destructively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when a pattern is able to sustain itself without outside agency or impulse because it is so efficiently self-referential and the optimal sustainable wave is the golden ratio the golden ratio is the geometry of the heart during compassion it's the geometry of the brain waves during inspiration so inspiration and compassion with physical flow and the desire to work with the land in a meaningful uh, coherent way that's sustainability not turning off your light or protesting against uh, carbon taxes you know all that stuff is just distractions you know we we have an that's true sacredness that's when you're living a sacred life not when you obey a series of dictates that are designed to control and uh not quite sure what got us onto that topic but <laughs> that's okay i absolutely love this conversation <laughs> i've had a lot of fun today <laughs> tell, tell the audience how they can get in touch with you you know, because somebody out there is going to hear this and they're going to want to hire you. So I think you should say it out loud here. Well, we're, we're very open. We, we, we connect with people whenever they contact us. We share like this and we chat. And if there's a resonance and a synergy, we absolutely go for it. So um, everybody needs that opportunity. So primarily email. Um, so there, there is an email that's, uh, shall I speak it out or will you just show it afterwards? It's, uh, yeah, uh, I'll get it. We'll put it in the description. Okay, yeah, it's Zemark. Now, it's interesting because Zana and Michael is Z or Z, Z and an M. 
And uh, but in the Slovak language, Zana Slovak, Zem means earth. The word mm. for earth is Zem. And then ARC is another word like architecture, A-R-C. So it's Z-E-M-A-R-C, Zemark at Zem.design, not dot com, Zem.design. It was actually our website as well, is Zem Design. It is, but uh, I don't want to lock this into perpetuality, um, perpetuity okay. now, but have, at that moment, there's a bit of difficulty with the website. We've okay, they'll just email you. Just wanted it's, to get that yeah, clear. Yeah, exactly. it's a, so email. We're also available on Telegram or Signal, but uh, I can give you the number, so I won't read it out here now, but if someone is interested, they can contact you and you can interface with us. Who knows, maybe you'll end up being the builder, you know? So yes, look, we're, we're, we're absolutely open and ready so. to so, you know, we do really feel that, um, you know, the whole concept and dichotomy of, of dystopia, utopia, it's another distraction that ultimately there's a bifurcation going on here in the world at the moment. There is a choice points that are happening more and more and more uh, in, a, in a rapid wham, wham, wham. Who do you wish to be? What do you wish to create? Who are you? What do you want? Who are you? What do you want? And where do you wish to di divest and invest your um, attention? So we are very personally and professionally interested in people who wish to just tip the hat of whatever else people want to believe in, but they want to put their time and energy and attention and money, resources, et cetera, into creating something beautiful. And that can be something very small and simple, or it could be a collective intention to do something astounding, a bit like the Venus Project or something. I have yeah. issues. I have issues with the Venus Project for ten different reasons, but I love the intention behind it. Um, you know, the, well, I think we're going to see some big changes in the years to come. And I, honestly, twenty years ago, I thought it would have already happened, but I think it's on the way. And you know, yeah. I hope to be working alongside you and and doing some Absolutely. very satisfying, rewarding work. You know, increasing our sustainability and our our yeah. bliss level on the earth here. So. Oh, totally. And, and I mentioned earlier that um, Zan and I are dancing between uh, Slovakia, Austria and Portugal and Ireland, basically. It's okay. a bit of a dance, but um, all of our clients are online. So by that, I don't mean it's a continuous online. We have an initial meeting like we're having now. We chat about life, the universe and everything, and then um, define the parameters of the vision. We establish some sort of way forward and then that's it. So because we mentioned the shamanic way of working, it's like remote viewing. It's like um, that the land already speaks. It's not limited. If there's an opportunity and a resource availability to go and see the site and meet the people, fantastic, we're open. But it's not necessary or required because we have successfully interfaced with the land and the people remotely because ultimately we are just bubbles in, in, in the jello, you know? We are able to feel connect with, interpret, and express all those elements and energies of the land, no matter where it is on this beautiful plane. And uh, so, you know, within that, we're very much open to connect with people and ask, and happy to chat. And uh, let's spread the word about all of these things like you're doing, you know? And uh, we're available yeah. to give interviews, to give talks, to, to chat. And uh, so yeah, so email is the best bet. And I'll leave you with my, you have my Telegram number, so you can have it in there, Signal or Telegram. Um, that can be a direct line as well. Yeah, yeah I'm we trying don't... to connect everybody. You know, I have, a, I have a group, we meet every month or so, the Inventor's Corner, and it's nice. a bunch of, you know, professional natural builder type folks, inventors, and we just get together and talk about whatever. We talk about our projects and, and what we're yeah, interested yeah. in and it's fascinating if you ever want to come sit in with that group you're more than welcome oh, man, i'd love to really, love to. really good group of guys yeah. um, and you know i met uh jay dubinsky through dan winter also you know i went to visit dan in france uh, yeah, a couple yeah, months yeah. ago it was great he's such a great guy yeah and, absolutely. Um, i just felt compelled to go see him you know because he really shifted my life for the better yeah. with his teachings and um and then he introduced me to Jay, who is involved with the Energyme group. I'm sure you know Jay. I'm not so, personal. I know well, of him. It's, it's amazing what they're doing right now with the technologies they're bringing forward, like uh, new types of uh, hydrogen energy storage. And uh, they got uh, solar 
energy collection with these concentrators that work day and night. They use infrared spectrum and it's just incredible what they're doing. So I, 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 I see like disparate points and I start to connect things and I see um, a lot of potential, you know, like between the buildings that you and I can design and create and then these technologies, which will really make them uh, viable. Like as we move forward and the technologies get better and better, um, it's just really exciting, you know, because you'll have definitely, we already have the ability now even to create these homes where it, it just does everything for you. You know, the home will process your waste. It will produce yeah. food. It'll produce energy. And it's, it's really only a matter of time and it's not going to be too expensive. It's just, we just got to put all the pieces together. So I'm excited about the future. Very excited. So yes, please uh, invite me in. Um, I'd love to, I'd love to join into that collective. So there's so much to share right now. There's so much. It's a beautiful future. Um, have you heard of Charles Charles Eisenstein? Sure. Charles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Charles is a friend of mine, and uh, but wow. it'd be worth getting, it'd be worth getting him on the podcast. Oh, I'd say definitely. <laughs> so That'd be I have, huge. If you want to introduce us? That'd be huge. Yeah, yeah. I have I have an email for him, and just say that I recommend it. I think it'd be fantastic because he has visions on everything. But he, he has written many books, but one of them really touched me. It's called The Most Be The More Beautiful World That Our Hearts Know Is Possible. Mm. That's the title of the book. Wow. So he'd be a very interesting guy to get on the podcast. And I'm sure he'd make time and just say, look, I, I, I'm the interface there. Uh, I'll give you his email and you write to him and uh, just mention we were talking. You know? Very cool. Very cool. Well, That'd thanks again, Michael. Man. Really appreciate you, man. And I'm looking forward to more conversations like this. So, oh, there's no end of it, you know. As you said, we make this stuff up as we go along, and that's what the future is about. But if we make <laughs> it up, again. From here, if we make it up from here, and this is a tool of communication, you know, yeah. then there's no end to where we can go with this. So, I want to thank everyone listening and watching, you know, and that you you too are part of this. Even if you're listening after the event, your attention is already fueling what we do right now in this so-called moment. So thank you for that uh, time and energy. And uh, thank you for setting this up. We stay in touch. All right. All right. Thank you, Take care. Bye-bye.